there we go. Shark reel serviced, ready for the big four and five hundred pound pull biggers or thrashes that we catch here on the Totally Awesome Fishing Show. Yet to see anybody else do that. Anyway, why I'm doing this is because the weather's bad. It's sort of one of those jobs that you get involved in when you have nothing to do, you cannot get out, you can't go freshwater fishing, you can't go trout fishing, it's too windy, you can't go on the sea. It's a nightmare. So what do you do? Play with your fishing tackle, if you'll excuse the phrase, or what about either refurbishing your fishing rod or building a new one? Now, some of you out there might say, building a new one, what's this man talking about? I just go in the tackle shop and buy one. Of course, you can go into a tackle shop. They do sell fishing rods. They are invariably already made, off the shelf, you get what you get, that's it. But when I was younger, we used to build all our own rods, trout rods, coarse rods, avon rods, barbel rods, pipe rods, beach rods, and that's what I do in the winter, as well as going and servicing all my big game tackle, ready for the shark season on high sea drifter, I go out beach fishing. Now, my tackle's pretty horrific, it does need a good old service and varnish, but you don't actually varnish them nowadays as well, guys. I've learned this because I've been down to West Sussex with possibly Britain's longest serving, well, I think he is his longest serving, he's been doing it since he was 16, rod builder, to the trade, but he is now doing more and more private work, refurbs, totally new builds, so you get your rod blank, away you go to Graham, he will build it for you. Look, guys, you can build them yourselves. We all used two years ago, 30, 40 years ago, all my guys built their own fishing rods. It's the way it was, we buy them in kit form, put them together. I just thought it'd be really interesting, given the weather, you might want to know, let's say, what goes into a beach rod? How do you build a beach rod? It's pretty interesting. Let's get down to Sussex, see what Graham has to say, and somebody else from a very important British company called Conoflex is going to turn up and might even give us a bit of an insight, a bit of an interview into actually what a rod blank is. Well, I'm down here, one of the uh, top rod builders in Britain, who's been around a long time, Graham Dadswell, and we're down in Sussex at his rod building complex here, I'm gonna call it, and who should turn up to check if his stuff's been made, but Aidan from Conoflex. Conoflex is a famous British make, and he hopefully might be able to, while he's here, tell you a little bit about, say, a beach rod, which is what we're gonna be talking about, how a beach rod actually comes to fruition. So, Aidan, good to see you. Hello Greg, nice to see you. Now, tell me something, and the folks on YouTube, about how does it arrive from birth? How does a fishing rod start, you know, a beach rod? Well, we buy in material, a great big roll, so it might be fiberglass, it might be carbon fibre, it might be a mixture of the two. We buy it in, and then we cut it into various shapes. Now, the, the shapes control the properties of the rod, depending on how you get the angles and how, the, how the, you cut the thickness. It's a cloth, isn't it? It's, it's, a, it's almost like a cloth, cloth, isn't it? The cloth comes in and it's it's the, the material and it's already impregnated with the resin. Not fully cured, but partially cured. We call it a pre-preg or pre, pre-impregnated pre glass. Yeah. Or carbon. And then, as I say, we cut it into size. Then what we'll do is we'll select uh, a mandrel, as we call it, and this is a tapered piece of steel. And we look at the taper of that steel, depending once again what properties we want. Sure. Then we will roll this cut of material. It might be a number of cuts, different materials, some glass, some carbon. And we'll roll it round this piece of tapered steel. Then we'll tape it so you've got like, the steel is the inside of the mould, then you've got the material, then you've got some tape that's the outside of the mould. Yes. And then you cook it. And once again, depending what materials you're using, different length cook times, different speed of cook time. In like what, an oven or in something? In an oven. Or? In a big oven. We've got a couple of big ovens and we can work them. Um, and then after a certain length of time, we then use uh, a machine handmade by my father and the local blacksmith many years ago. <laughs> it's paid yeah. for itself, that one. Uh, and we pull the steel out of the middle, we take the tape off the outside, and there is your blank. So it's set, it's set it's in there. Set. Now when you when you roll it up, this cloth, you roll it all up, you don't coat it with anything on top of that, it's just no. that impregnation yep. sort of sets with the heat. That's right. And what temperature would that be, you know, in your ovens? You're, you're working at somewhere between, depending what resin system you're using, somewhere around about 125 degrees centigrade, but between 100 to 125 is... And how long would they have to be in the, in the baking oven? Between an hour and an hour and a half. Again, you know, it, it's specified on the material that you use. 
Now then, fishermen know, or they don't, might not know, so we're going to tell them, you've got materials like fibreglass, which I would classify as soft, say carbon fibre, which I assume is all still being used now, which is stiff. But you can get rods in either, but you can also get a blend called a composite. Tell us just about those three, you know, the glass compared with carbon fibre, or whatever you use now, and, you know, how you make a composite. Fibreglass was the first material that was available, um, and that's why, I mean, my father was involved in designing and manufacturing reliably tubular glass rods. Um, and then as um, carbon fibre came in and um, a number of designers were involved in that, um, as, as that came in, so it started to take over. The nice thing about carbon is it's strong against its weight, so you end up with a rod that is quite stiff but quite light. Glass is slightly heavier, but it is more resilient and it has the ability to bend. Yeah. And what you need to do is to blend the two so you get the power where you want it, but the movement where you want it as well. And you'll find that um, in the old days they used to use what we call fast taper rods, and that would give you this performance from a soft tip to a more powerful midsection. Sure. And now what we use is we'll use a, 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 a more medium taper rod yep. and we'll use carbon where we want the power and then we'll have the glass where we want the, the sort tip. of bite detection or something well, like that it's, it's bite detection and casting with a beach rod also to make it more friendly to to work between the shock of the lead and the power of the rod somewhere you could have a bit of movement but also when you're you've got the rod set out um, and you've got the weight down on there you've got the surf pounding down on the line sure if you're if the tip is too stiff, then it's going to bump your lead out. I mean, especially in like um, southern beaches where you're you're working gripper leads. I mean, obviously in some uh, rocky outcrops that doesn't happen yeah. quite so much. But you know, you need that bit of movement out there, a bit of shock absorption. Yes, and of course, um, it it can help with um, bait presentation because sure. you're getting more bait out. It's more intact. And um, it can also, with a, with a slightly softer tip, you usually find that you cast with a slightly higher trajectory, which means if you cast with a higher trajectory, it'll, it, it tends to drop almost vertically in. Where if you cast lower, it tends to skim in. And once again, it's bait presentation as well. So yeah. there's all that sort of stuff that we get into the design. Where do you use glass? Where do you use carbon? We're starting to use what we call S-glass now, which is slightly different. It's still... A, a silica glass, but it's now um, stronger, stiffer. It's the same stiffness as some of the intermediate modulus carbons, oh, really? but yeah. it has this resilience and this ability to bend. You can, when you bend something, it stores energy. You see. Yeah. So we've we, we've got this now that where it is, you 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 can keep it slightly stiffer up in the tip, but it doesn't lock up like the carbon does. Yes, right yeah. I mean, we've, we've, we've seen carbon um, boat rods, I'm sure you fish with yeah, carbon yeah. boat rods, and they bend to a certain point and they lock up and then all the load from there on is on you and yes, you're fighting yeah. with it. Whereas, of course, with your glass rods, you pull, it pulls and you work. More forgiving. Yes, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. Well, we're now getting it where, with the S-glass and um, they're hoping to uh, get some S, some even some high modulus glass. We'll see if that happens. It'll but, change again, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but at the moment we, we can use our S-glass and we, all of our S-glass is, um, has like this blue coloration to it. You can see that blue there where it blends in to the black. The that's, black is the carbon. That's part of the blank, yeah. And this is the S-glass. This is the unidirectional S-glass. So that is slightly stiffer than the normal um, E-glass. Um, but it's still got that movement, that resilience and the ability to bend. So now, this is what we're working a lot on. Here is a rack of, obviously, plastered with the old, uh, good old British Go faster, Union, Union flag. Go Jack. Yeah, exactly. And that's one of your better sellers. This is, this is uh, some yes. of the squams already built up, ready for you. And I guess they go, what, to the epoxy build for the whipping stage? Is that the next stage? Yes, day? that's it. He, he's, he's now waiting and he'll be loading them up with the epoxy and then you'll be putting them on the dryers. But yes, that's our Flatty Fanatic. It's yeah. a good old sta staple, one of our rods. A very, a good utility rod. It'll do all sorts of things that you can, you can use it off the pier. You can 
Um, it's fish it out of hand, you can fish it off of a rest, you can use baited spoons, traces, you can bump a lead with it. 12 foot? Is it? We do 11 foot and 12 foot, the original was 11 foot. And what are they going to throw? What sort of, what, 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 not heavy weight, weight we, stones we, I imagine? We were rated, the 11 foot was 1 to 3 ounces and the uh, Mark II, the 12 foot, is 2 to 4 ounces. You just get a little bit more leverage on it a little bit more into the butt. Now these things, because you're building down here with Graham, yep. uh, people can have these customised to whatever they want, can't they? You know, as regards fittings, rings and stuff like that. Can they have an individual rod made with that blank? We source rings um, from a number of places and within reason we can have rings. Obviously if we think it's unsuitable or if it's going to be too expensive then um, we'll advise people appro appropriately. We can position winch fittings wherever they want them. Um, if they want to have different grips on them. Colours, we, we've got a, a range of colours that we can use yeah. um, and providing we can work with them. You'll see this is just a, a plain whip that we've got, a single colour whip. And then down below you'll see what we're, we're putting, what we call tippings on. Oh, this yeah. is a, a Welsh colour that we do where it's the red, green and white. So we can do combinations of colours. Um, if people want some really fussy stuff, then we'll have to consider that a custom charge. But we try to do a lot to meet the customer. Uh, now, Aidan, I've always been really pleased with all your Conoflex stuff. I've had them far too long. <laughs> they're, still, they're still going, they're still casting, and thank God as a fisherman they're still catching. But I'm looking at some rather longer rods here, and there seems to be a bit of a tendency to actually go a bit bigger with them. So what are these blanks? And I also want to know, what's that sort of rubber tubing down there? Because that, does that get peeled off or what? What's that about? Yes, these are our red dragons. They're actually 13 foot. Now these are all carbon and as you can see they're um, slimmer in design and they're more of a, a medium taper. Um, these Welsh dragons are going out with our the uh, red dragon logo and they're off up into some of our Welsh shops. It's a custom build that we do for them. The um, tubing that we've got on here it's a heat shrink and it used to be i don't know if you remember the glossy poly uh heat shrink yeah i remember that yeah clear there. stuff i used to get off from yeah, your dad well, yeah and they used to be supplied in different colors uh, and then they started doing this texturized or rubberized ones and you could also get it with um, an embossed spiral that would go down it that looked very nice we use quite a lot of it on ours because we don't just use it for the grip, not just for the handhold. Yes, it's very long, it's so long. This is, this is good for that as well. But it's also to provide protection for the rod. Yeah. When, um, it's also to provide protection for the rod when it's in the rest. So you might be having that down in the, that might be on oh, the beach, yeah, this yeah. might be on the rest. In the tripod, yeah. Yeah, on a tripod, it might be up against a railing. And it's just to give that rod yeah. that <clears throat> reliability and that um, ruggedness that it that will give you service for many, many years. So this is what it's all about. So it's good, hard, hard strong stuff, this. Yeah, you can see it. and as I say, it good gives grip. a good grip when, it, when, it's, when it's wet. Um, and it's also serviceable in that when it does get, um, all, all covered in slime, slime fish slime we hope stuff. yes that's right it can be replaced and it, it we, we do it at when we do it at the factory we will put the length on we'll put it in the oven and we'll cook it down and it goes down very quickly very evenly it can still be done at home and I can see obviously up here which is from the bottom if you had a tripod you've got the the cup that the tripod goes in it's going to rub there as well but also if you go rock fishing yep. i guess most fishermen would have done it they jammed it down in a rock some it's leaning yep. up it's getting scratched on the varnish it's better to get that scratched than, than, than the carbon exactly itself, because that, once you start damaging the carbon then you're affecting the life of the rod really there aren't you so that's that's that we looking across we've got a little uh, part of our cfx bass this is um a bass rod that we do 12 foot again two to four ounces but this is combining a carbon butt as you can see a slight a slim carbon butt with a composite you asked about that once again there's carbon in the bottom end and then we go up into the glass oh it's tip. quite soft that one isn't it yeah soft yeah. so you're looking at that for when you're, you're bass fishing and, and flounder as well you need to have that nice little bit of give in there as well and then you're talking about the longer rods over here, we've got a rod that's going to go 14 foot plus. I think this is 14.6. Yeah. Six. yeah. And um, this is a, a, a carbon, but this has got a woven carbon in here. You've got carbon running up and down, and you've got glass going yeah. in a hoop. And um, 
We use this, it's um, distance nice cast, I imagine, is this one or? Yes, that's right. So it looks like, Aiden, there's still lots going on in the Conoflex factory, and obviously, you know, new products coming through all the time. So I appreciate you giving us a little tip. I think Graham's going to show us how he does a, a build on some of these rods here in a minute. He'll give us an insight into beach rods. So, you know, uh, where would people get these rods from? Well, we we supply into the shops, so if you've got a your favourite tackle shop, go and see them and ask about a Conoflex rod. Uh, you can check our list of approved dealers on our website. We're also on Facebook and on Twitter and we give out updates on what we're doing in the factory and any new products we've got coming out. We're always looking at new materials when they come out and how they suit us and we're trying to suit the needs of all sorts of different areas of the angling market. We can produce small numbers of rods to suit the various many applications there are of fishing. So, okay. um, well, listen, thank you very much for your time. I think your rod builder, Graham, has had a cup of tea for long enough now, and we've got to get him here and do some rod building. Good. OK. Thank you very much, Graham. Nice no to meet problem. you. Oh, it's so hot in here with this rod building. I've had to, I've had to start stripping off. <laughs> now, calm down. I'm not stripping off that much. Come on. But I'll tell you what, when we're talking about beach rods, this brings back some very fond memories of stuff. This is shrink tube. I didn't have red. I think I had blue and I think I had clear that uh, they used to send me from Conoflex. And putting that on... But mentioning the modern shrink wrap they have there, I call this shrink tube, I don't know what the real name of it is, it might be just shrink wrap. They obviously get some in other colours as well. Yep, all kinds of different colours grow. That one you had there in your hand is a vinyl one, which you used years ago. Um, we used to fit that over top the A1 butts, which was an aluminium butt section, then went on to, onto the glass sections. Um, I, yeah, did, that, I did have one of those aluminium butts. Very, very slippery, not a lot of grip to it. Yeah, I did, I did have one, and that was one of the problems, I was going to say, that we get covered in fish lime. The next cast, you had to keep wiping your hands all the time because you couldn't get really good grip on the rod. That was a sort That's of drawback. It. Yeah, it? it was a good job, wipe, clean, finish, nice and easy to clean. But um, these days, we use, again, it is a shrink wrap, but it's a better material. They have a rubberized finish. Um, comes in plain and in patterns and in several different colours. You can also get a, a yellow and a green for that which I haven't got at the moment. And so same principle, in, it, it slides down over the butt? Yeah, slide it over the butt, heat it up with a heat gun, gradually start one end, gradually feed it down over, over the blank and it will, will, will shrink down. Does it matter where you start? Or do you, In the middle yeah, of the blank and then no, work backwards each? You or what? want to start one end and work your way down. As you start, you'll gradually see it start to close down. As it closes down, just keep it going, just come and keep it flowing, try not to stop and start. Oh, I see. Keep it flowing one into the other, and it will gradually shrink. But as it, as it shrinks in diameter, it will uh, elongate. Soften as well. I see, so it go it'll longer. elongate a little bit as well, yeah. But you need to allow, allow an overlap for when, over, over the length you want. Gotcha. And that will just gradually, uh, as I say, elongate down. Let it cool down, and then trim it back. But Put a piece of masking tape round where you want to cut it and then just trim it back once it's cooled down. Okay, now over here, good. over here yeah. I see something, something from the uh, prehistoric Sorry. times. Now that looks like an old Marco winch fitting that brass, is, winch fitting uh, there. No, it's not a Marco one. Well, it's not a one. That's, that's a modern arms fitting, yeah. which I've had with me for many years. Um, that was made by modern arms, really nice quality stuff, obviously long gone. But a lot of companies um, after the wars turned to producing fish and tackle. It was good quality fittings. Yeah. Um, and this was one of them, Modern Arms. And they produced lovely quality work. They did the, the real seats, ferrules. Yeah. Um, these are the brass ferrules, which a lot of the. Uh, that was a standard years ago um, for rock builders, yeah. The people we come across will remember these. Oh, well, I do, yeah. This was the standard fitting to, uh, um, to join the two sections together. In brass, parallel there. A glued and again. We you didn't have to pin them or anything. We would, no, no, no. They would just be glued, glued on, press glued. Presumably, we want like arrow or something. Halfway with an arrow dike or something similar. Um, up to about halfway, and long enough for this to go right inside. But I've had these a few years, you know. But no call for them now unless someone's got a really old rod they want restored that's true i suppose if you want a restoration you that's money in the bank because you can't buy them you can't buy them now i don't think no uh, this is a conoflex red dragon which is will all be whipped up in welsh colors um it's a big built from for a multiplier 
uh, as opposed to a fixed ball, which the multiplier ring and is a lot more eyes on, a lot more eyes on the blank, um, as opposed to a fixed ball which has got less eyes but bigger. These will be smaller, more gradient coming down the blank. Because with a fixed ball, it's, it's you're trying to you cone the line coming off the line spool, in, aren't you? Yeah. Whereas a multiplier, which just is which just feeding side to side into one level. Yeah. Um, so they have more, more eyes on and gets a nice performance on the blank. Yeah. Which I wish I can do, depending on what people want me to do. And also, yeah. uh, we mentioned in a previous film on you, but about the spine on these, which way would you put the spine on a beach rod like this? Yeah, I'd put the spine towards the, if you were fishing with it, towards the sea. Towards the sea, towards yeah. Towards the yeah. sea, yeah, because these eyes will face towards you on a multiplier. Um, so I'd put the spine on the rod towards the sea, and that gives you that tip, that, that yeah. tip action that... It, it's probably it seems painfully obvious that anglers have done a lot but if there's beginners out there the yeah. fixed ball wheel is on the underneath of the rod as are the yeah. rod rings yeah it multiplies the other way and it? it's It'd reverse on the top of the rod on yeah. the top yeah. of the rod yeah yeah and uh, generally speaking i mean you can have a fixed ball reel seat if you prefer but generally speaking people will use coasters or something similar to that which is a movable reel seat up and down yeah clamps they move it up and down where if you just keep it they can tweak it to suit the best but the downside of a fixed rule spit and real fitting is that it is fixed yes that position. so but if you're an experienced angler and you know where you want your real seat we can fit them wherever you want them now you can just see the enormous size of this hoop this 50 mil ring but if you think that's big let's look at the other end of the scale because graham here has got what there graham there you go graham these are, these are the smallest eyes that Fuji ever made. If you can get it out. Get it out. That compared was with the 50. Compared with that 50, that was the smallest eyes that Fuji ever made. That is absolutely it's ridiculous. Got, it's got a 1.5 diameter internal bore. 1.5 <laughs> diameter? <laughs> which I use on my quiver tip rods. My really I, fine quiver tip rods. I can barely rods. see it, let alone trying to put a line through the middle of it. I could just zoom in there. They, they don't make them anymore. I mean, it's got it's actually miniature, a work of art, because it's got the insert there and everything, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's a lovely made ring. Absolutely. Uh, when I was uh, first starting into beach fishing too many years ago, they told me that the idea of measuring where to put that winch fishing was to put the rubber under your armpit here and if the reel's on top for multiplier, put your thumb there, and that's about where the winch fishing, winch fitting should go. You don't want it too short, you don't want to be overstretching, because when you cast, it catches round you. So that's right. what I was told, and I did have some of those sliding fittings. So those right. sliding fittings, what exactly yeah. are, are yeah. they and how they go? Well, the sliding fittings are, the, the most common ones are the coasters. These are a spring steel, which literally just slide, slide up and down the blank. This is if you don't want to fix winch fitting. If you don't want to fix winch sure. fitting yet, this allows you to move it around to tweak it where you, where you actually want it, where it's most comfortable. But as, as you say, generally, if I was fishing for a fixed ball, yes. then as you say, you'd be right underneath under your arm. Um, so you just get your two fingers round the round the foot of the real seat. Yeah. Um, and you can still pick the, pick the line up. Yes. You don't want to be stretching too far. Yeah. And too short, you won't get the performance out of the blank. Yes, you we'll won't be able to put the power into, it. power into it. So you want to finish it just under your arm. And bear in mind, if you always allow a little bit because if you've uh, got a big jacket or something on, that's true. There's a bolt a little bit short, where otherwise it end up getting caught in the web. Yeah, under your arm. And, um, and you can also that, have these down as well, can't you? These, yeah, you can have them reel down, put down. But generally speaking, if someone's fishing reel down, which is where the position would be generally about four inches from the from the bottom of the rod oh here you've got one taped up yeah, ready this is tape ready for a customer yes he's marked his exact position where he wants it and you literally hold the bottom of the blank thumb on the, on the spool yeah whatever you, um that's considered real down and this this customer wants it with the threads turning down which we call down locking oh, i see so yeah. that he's not holding the threads under his hand that's it's much clever. more comfortable yeah, that's all that's the you're reversing the shape of the winch fitting yeah and yes, it winds down onto the reel. Down. So yeah, when you put your it. hand over the reel, you haven't got the thread on your hands or fingers to get in the way at all. That's or it. slip yeah, or move. It's much more comfortable. Yeah, and people can have that where they where they want. And generally you'd use that with a reducer yes. when you're retrieving. Now a reducer's for, for bringing it in, isn't it? Obviously you couldn't yeah. if you had, if I showed people from the side there, if you had to imagine the reels there, if you were yeah. trying to wind in there, it'd be right under here. You yeah. want it out there, so you'd slide an extra tube up, would you? 
Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah to it make it longer. Just a short piece of uh, carbon, which is a slide in the end. Just, and it's just to give you the actual facility of being yeah. a bit longer. That's, that's a, yeah, just makes it easier for retrieving. This is not the right size for that, but that is what we would do. That's what they have. It that's a reducer. So you've got there. another 12 inches yeah. on the back. Just extends it, plus we'll retrieve the line. I've got you, I've got you, yeah. Now, that, what, that what would, would you do? You, you wouldn't have a back cap then, would you? You wouldn't need a back cap? Uh, if no. you have a reducer, you don't have a back no. cap? No, the, um, the back cap would be on the reducer. Okay. The reducer. What would you do for a back cap if you had the reel up here for standard beach fishing, fishing up? What sort of yeah, you you we used to have a rubber bun years ago. Up. Yeah, still the same. Still RB, the same old RBCs. You can get the dimpled ones. See, some things last or, when they're old. My rubber see. buns are worth money. <laughs> yeah, you get the round, the plain round one, the yeah, RBC. You get a bit of a grip as well. Or a dimpled one still, like you have on the bottom of a walking stick. Yes. You call yeah. it a dimpled one. Again, it's personal preference. But if you were fishing that with a um, multiplicator, yes. then the distance you would put, or I would recommend, if you measure from the nipple yes. to the end of your thumb, so the thumb would be on on the spool. On the spool. Yes, yeah. that's worth knowing. A little bit and longer that's, than that. And then that's then. most comfortable. Just a fraction longer. It's a bit longer than the fixed spool okay. positions, yeah. A bit longer. And that allows you to give it more power. More power. More power. Yeah. Any longer than that. And you, it's just uh, not going to work. You're going to get caught. You're going to get caught in your clothing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Just on the thumb, generally from the from your nipple to the end of your thumb, it would sort just right. Good job. Yeah, for, for most people. Yeah. For most yeah. people. But as always, some people like it a little different. But if they like it different, then we can do it different. Okay. Now we mentioned about the smaller rings and more rings for a multiply rod, but sometimes I'll see them with little, you know, green isotopes on the tip ring. You know, is there a special ring for that? There used to be. Used to be. These were available. I'm not sure they are still available now. But that was a was an art at Fuji made. Um, had a frame on the top. And the chemical mini chemical lights would slide in, and that was a, in my opinion, a brilliant tool, brilliant tool. Um, but as far as I'm probably not aware anymore. But what they use now is batteries, little battery lights, which are about an inch, inch and a quarter long. Yeah. And um, they've used those. We've got a couple of batteries in, or they use a chemical light with two brackets. Yes. Either either end, and they just snap snap the light. Can clip it in. But did so that you one? Could you cast it? with that? Could you cast you with that cast one? With this, yeah. Oh, but you can't cast with the modern ones. Much less likely to snag than yes. using a um, a battery one. A battery one. Yeah, these were these were a brilliant idea, but for some reason tended to go out of fashion when different things come along. Um, and of course, most people have the fluorescent tape on the tip of the rod anyway. Some people have yeah, white gloss paint. paint. Some, Just some plain white, white gloss. Some are white gloss. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> old, old boys have white paint. Whatever's whatever's <laughs> in the garage is left out. <laughs> that's, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the white paint, or we, we do a whipping now, which is sort of fluorescent and uh, looks quite nice. There's a, another idea there, Graham. This this rod comes um, supplied with a, a sliding reel, reel seat. That's the fixed reel seat, but it comes sliding. And people finish it off themselves. So the blank's finished, the whole thing's the whipped up. The blank's finished, the rod's completely finished. But this allows people to personalise the handle and the grip themselves. And they literally just measure up whether it's for fixed spool or for multiplier. They can decide, and they can move that around till they find the most comfortable position. Yeah. And once they and then glue it in place. Once that's glued in position. Yeah. Then they finish it off with the self adhesive tapes. Oh, I see. Uh, like a, a sort comes, of. It comes in different colours. It's like a tennis racket um, grip then. Like a cricket like bat and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Sort of grip, self adhesive tape, and you can finish it off, customise it to how our customer wants it. Now uh, the. Uh, when the eyes come, generally, generally, as a guide rule, the uh, the rear foot is about a millimetre longer than the front foot. So when I'm uh, whipping them on, I use vernier just to just to gauge the uh, the distance of the whipping. So then on both sides will be exactly the same. They look nice and even. It's like a much more professional finish. Both of all of them being even all the way up the rod, as, as opposed to one being shorter than the other. There we go. That's a that's a finished rod uh, for for a customer. It's made exactly as he wants. It's an RBC butt cap, shrink Japanese shrink tubing, green and white tippings, fixed reel seat to a position he'd already indicated where he wanted it. Up there, moving up. Um, it is a, a flat complex uh, flatty beach quiver. So done. Moving up to the 
the quiver tip there. Which you notice are very small eyes. These are used with fixed ball reels. Uh, very popular at the moment. Very popular. And uh, hopefully you'll uh, with a phone call and you'll be in to pick that up in the next couple of days. Here, Graham, thank you very much indeed. Appreciate everything okay. you put through in, showing us a bit more, a few tips, a few totally awesome fishing tips there about how to build a beach rod and some of the tips. So appreciate it's a that. Pleasure. Thank you very much. I shall be bringing all mine down for renovation. Not a problem, not a problem. <laughs>